Welcome to the show. Larry Lawton might be the only ex-con in the U.S. to be sworn in as an honorary police officer. He spent 11 years in some of the toughest federal prisons in the country. But that's not why we're here today. We're here today because he stole over $18 million in diamonds. Today, we're going inside the mind of one of the most prolific jewelry thieves in American history. Come with us today as we plan a fake heist and hear stories you won't get anywhere else, no matter how many rounds of Grand Theft Auto you've played or how many movies you've been binging since the pandemic started. Started. Here we go with Larry Lawton. This guy is fascinating. Enjoy. By the way, I was wondering, since you knew John Gotti, I wonder if you knew Sammy the Bull. Ah, I used to go to Sammy the Bull's club. Uh, well, I knew him and of him. I knew who he was, of course. Obviously, he had a club on 18th Avenue, but he had a, really a private club on Stillwell Avenue in Brooklyn. I lived right off Stillwell Avenue, and the home stretch bar where I hung out was on King's Highway. And there was a, uh, a, a construction office he had. It was really a private club. I used to go there with somebody. Not knew him like, hey, how you doing? I wouldn't want to be near him that much. Everybody knew he was a murderer. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't know he killed 19 people. I didn't know he killed his brother-in-law. But everybody knew he was, a, he was a legitimate killer. You know, there's no question about that. Yeah, yeah, I wondered. Because uh, now he's like kind of a nice old guy who just like hangs out with his kids and grandkids. Well, you know, I saw that, and I'll tell you the truth, Jordan. Uh, when I saw him, and first of all, he got out. He got the deal of the lifetime. You want to talk about a guy who killed 19 people, and just because the government wanted John Gotti, they gave this guy a deal to go home and keep his money, and then he becomes an ecstasy dealer in yeah. Arizona and does 20 – Fucking years. Can I curse on this show? I don't know. Yeah. And I look at that and I said, are you kidding me? Listen to me. They got me for four 12-year sentences. Yes, I, don't get me wrong. I was the biggest jewel robber in the country. And, but I did not kill people. I wasn't beating people or pistol whipping people. Yes, don't get me wrong. And I never want people to, un, to think that I'm justifying what I did. Because I'm not. But there is a difference. You know, when I was in prison and I did four 12-year sentences, I uh, went in in 1996, got out in 2007. You know, my mom even used to say, never like what I did. My mom was a saint woman. And she goes, but why do you get so much time and a child molest to get five years? Mm -hmm. You know, so the, there's this disparity. Just like this. How do you give a guy, I don't care what he gave you, five years for 19 murders? Yeah. Am I missing something here? I mean, it's just yeah. so out of whack. It's the government wanting somebody so bad that they'll get you, and that, yeah. they don't—they don't care what it is. Sadly, that's that's definitely what it is. They they had to make a statement, and they knew they could trade him for the for the big guy for the big boss. Yeah, but you know, at what point is somebody worse than the big boss? Uh, John Gotti and Sammy. Sammy was the underboss, and he was making decisions. He ran the construction. He ran a lot of that kind of stuff. Yes, did he kick up money? Yes, you know, was he going through Gotti for certain things? Yes, but at that level, you know, those guys and even myself, we all made money. How it works is we made money. And when you make money, they don't tell you you'd make it this way and go here. You come up with your own schemes, your own mm -hmm. plans, if you want to call it that, and you make money. I was a robber. I had a buddy who was a drug dealer. Now, I love that line. Oh, we don't like drugs. Bullshit. Everybody knows they're making money. They had the pizza connection in the 80s. I was in prison where they would take it, bring it in heroin from Italy to all the pizzerias. And it was a $200 million operation or something like that, more than that. And here they all go, they go to prison. So, oh, but they're not making money on drugs. That's bullshit. And they don't want mm -hmm. drugs. You know, all oh, that's bullshit. But everybody comes up with their own plan. And then the money gets kicked up. At what point is Larry Lawton or Sammy Gravano or whoever it is for that matter worse than the guy just getting money on the top? I mean, listen, you take the guy out on top, guess what? Somebody else steps into the role. So it's not like, oh, you're cutting off the head of the snake and the snake's dead. That's not right. Well, that's how the that's how Gotti got the boss position because Sammy killed Paul Castellano, I think, right? N know it very well. Matter of fact, I've been to Paul Castellano's house. 
Paul Castellano had a house on Staten Island called in in, in a place called Toad Hill, uh, and uh, in there they, they it looked they called it the White House because it looked like a, it's got the it had the big the big beams and all that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. And it, and it was the White House. I used to go up there with uh, a, my boss, and he used to say, "Come on, you're taking a ride." And I'd go up there, and I was a kind of a muscle, if you want to call it. But I, not that he needed any, but he'd just take a ride because he had to go to Staten Island from Brooklyn, which I had to go over to Verrazano Bridge. And I would go with him, take a quick ride over there. So, And then when that happened, my guy was more with Paul Castellano. So it was kind of like a very tension time. Uh, what's going to happen? Who's going to align? Everybody came in a line, if you want to call it that, but it wasn't easy. You know, There was a lot of hard feeling stuff like that going around. And I was a young kid. Well, not that young. I was in my 20s, mid-20s. And I was just getting out of the Coast Guard. I was working in a bar in uh, uh, Queens called Luke's Piano Lounge. Boy, but I learned a lot there. I mean, it was, wasn't really a bar. It was a bookmaking joint with card games, everything. So, And I used to take action and learn the bookmaking business and do and muscle for the game as well. So how did you get into the business of stealing gems i know you grew up tough in the bronx your neighbors were kind of working class and or in the mob but how does that lead to you stealing gems well i mean first first thing is when i grew up around that life and when i say the life the mobs is next to me the mobs are down the block and and the the guys with the cadillacs the money and then there's the working families obviously like you said but then when i got i was always a hustler when I say young, I was 11, 12 years old doing football tickets, making money. I remember making $125 in a week in, in 1972. 70, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a lot of money for a kid. And I was, what were we doing? I'm, Gambling with I'm it. I'm going to do the math with, on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much a week? $125 a week. 1972, $125. That's seven hundred and seventy-five dollars in today's money, and I was, per week, and I was just turning twelve years old. So that's three grand a month at age twelve. At age twelve, making money hand over foot, and gambling it and losing it and partying and waiting, going doing crazy things, buying the stupidest stuff in the world because I'm a kid. I still, but I love mm-hmm. to hustle. I learned to hustle, and then we we graduated to even stealing cars. We used to, we used to steal meat. We literally put. A I had, was it Safeway or Pathmark? Big, it's a northern grocery chain. We put them out of business, Jordan. We were still. We had guys working in there, bringing out the meat and the lobsters, putting it outside. We pick it up at night. We go sell it up and down the avenue. It was. I mean, we we always had hustles going. Then we were stealing cars and bringing them to a chop shop uh, in New York, and we were getting five hundred bucks a car. We didn't care what it was, five hundred bucks a car. And how were you stealing the cars? Oh, we you had, had to met, hotwire the cars. Well, we had a couple of guys who hotwired, or the best way was in New York, a guy pulls up to a a, be- a bagel store. And it's not like most areas. They pull up to the bagel store, they leave their car running, we'd wait, they'd go in, we'd jump in their car, we're gone. Literally. Or it's very oh, common. Man. Back in those days, it was very common. People would start their car up in the morning and go in, get their coffee, and get their heater going, defrost their windows and all that, yeah. and or cool it in the summertime. Oh, let me go put the car on, get it nice and cool. And we'd see the car running on the outside, walk up, boom, jump in the car, boom, gone. You're done. I mean, and literally, I mean, we'd go, some of, they didn't have GPSs. They didn't have the uh, OnStar and all that kind of stuff they had today. So it was easy to do. We'd take them before you know it. That car was a, a, a hunk of metal, literally a hunk <laughs> of metal, off of a golf course called Pelham and Split Rock. And uh, it was in the in the weeds, if you want to call it weeds, bushes, woods, whatever we used to call it in the Bronx. I mean, what in the Bronx? You don't have have that much kind of woods, but uh, you did, I guess. But anyway, and we, so I started doing that until I went into service. I, I was a pretty wild kid. I went into service at 17 years old. But when I got out of service, I got hurt in the service. And when I got out of the service, I got retired, military retired. I went right back. I went back to Brooklyn. And I knew the hustle game. So I had some connections, some people from the old days who are now my age, and they're doing stuff in the Bronx and Brooklyn because connections go all over the city. And the guy, I ended up getting a job with Mac the Bookie. Mac was the biggest bookie in New York. 
They say when Mac died, the economy went down. He used to take what they call the layoff action. That means when a bookie – see, a bookie's job is not what people think. A bookie's job is not being a gambler. A bookie is the house. So what they do is they take – let's just take a game, the Giants versus the Jets. I'm just going to take a fictional game. They want $100,000 on the Giants and $100,000 on the Jets. They make 10% VIG. It's called VIG or juice. They don't care who wins. They get 10%. So they make 10 grand. Not a bad, you know, act. They do that with a million. Now you're making 100,000, whatever it is. Well, when a bookie gets a lot of money on one side, what does he do? It's not like I could say no. So what he does is he takes that money. He goes to a guy like Mac, the guy I work for, who would take $50,000, $100,000 on the game because he was the house house. He was the house for the bookies. So when a bookie has too much on one side, he lays it off on Mac. And they negotiate the line because the line will be different because the line moves a lot. Well, I worked for Mac. Guy got me a job working for Mac. And I was behind the stick taking bets of 500, a nickel and dime. A dime is a 1,000, a nickel. And I was also muscle in a card game, meaning being the bouncer. Anybody got out of hand? They had a card game. It was, when I say thousands and thousands of dollars being thrown around down there, you know, my always thought, Pat, and I was the crazy guy. I was, oh, how can I rob this place? But, mm -hmm. you know, you're dead if you do that. But it, yeah. it's just, I like I in my book, I explain wanting to rob the guys that I knew there was millions down there. But I said, boo, that, that, that's a suicide mission. But anyway, and then, like you said, getting back into the uh, crime, my first robbery was a setup. My first robbery was a guy who wanted the insurance job. So when they wanted an insurance job, they called me and they said, Larry, we got a job for you and blah, blah, blah. Here's what it is. The guy wants the insurance. You're going to get to keep the jewelry and he's going to get his money and we're getting a cut of this action. I said, okay, good enough. Sure enough, I had to set it up just like a robbery. It was not like a uh, you could do it like knowing that he – because he wasn't going to let his employee. I What he gave us was I knew how many people were going to be in the store and I knew the best times to go. Like, you know, when there's the least customers or when, like, uh, nobody's coming by the mailman or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, because I ended up understanding the business a lot better after I started becoming so good at what I did. Because after my first robbery, Jordan, I said, wait a minute, there's so much. I made $150,000 cash, 1980. I think 89 maybe 88 this is 89. the so this is the first time you knocked off a jewelry store right right and a jewelry store. was that not i read that that was an insurance job right it was like an inside job for yeah, the guy insurance, like it, it was set up i call it yeah just, so I said okay set up. yeah okay so he set it up saying you basically you rob my store i'll claim the insurance money and for your efforts either you keep the stolen stuff and fence it or i give you this cash well, no, he wasn't involved in that. That was come from my boss. You get the stuff, bring it here, we're done, we'll cut the money up, and that's it. Okay. And they, they knew what to do with it. And I ended up knowing what to do with it, of course. But, yes, that's exactly how it happened. So it was – I knew there was going to only be one person in the store. I didn't I, – I knew there wasn't going to be somebody in the back behind a, a double mirror. I, I knew that nobody was going to come in, like the owner is going to pop in out of the back door. I knew that because that, those were given to us. Those were the information given to us. And once that happened, it, and I'll tell you what we talk about an adrenaline dress because the girl behind the counter had no idea. She actually reached for a gun, and I was so quick. You know, I jumped over the counter so quick, I, I and I said, are you crazy? And I was pointing a gun at her, and I had a BB gun. I didn't even have a gun. I didn't even have a gun. I didn't need a gun because You're lucky she didn't shoot your ass yeah, off, man. Exactly, you know, you know. But uh, I was a little bit quick, and and I I often laugh when people say I wish I had a gun. I wish I got. Trust me, I'll take that gun away from you. I mean, most people think it's oh I'm gonna have a gun. I'm gonna be a badass. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And then if you kill somebody, you got to live with that. You know, whether it's wrong, right, or indifferent. I know your childhood had. Uh, there's so many stories from your channel, and I encourage people to go look at it. We'll link to it in the show notes. I mean, you had like. Boosting the cars. There's stuff about you. You threw a Molotov cocktail at a guy fishing. I gotta say, that's like that goes beyond prank. You could have lit that guy on fire. That guy could have died, man. Horribly, in fact. You know, well, the way we did it, no, it probably sounded worse because he was on a jetty. Now it definitely made him jump in the water because you mm -hmm. couldn't go the other way. Uh, so 
like, see, there was fishing jetties. So when you're on a fish, you, you throw the glass, you break the glass into the jetty. Of course, there's glass all over the place. You put the fire goes there, and you have. There's only one way to go, and that was to the mm -hmm. water. So I mean, yeah, it sounded bad, but it, yeah, it is bad. It. Wait, wait a minute, Jordan. Let, let me try to uh, clean that up. It is bad. Obviously, I was a little crazy kid. Uh, matter of fact, Peter, my uh, manager, he's our COO, Peter. He 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 grew up with me. I mean, Peter built a company to mega mega. He built a, he had two hundred employees in New York and California. He invented eye traffic, which is uh, uh, affiliate marketing. He he's a genius. I mean, the guy's he's somewhat retired. I brought him out of retirement uh, to come work with me, and he remembers me because we were kids together. And he goes, "You were a hornet. You were crazy. You and your brother would fight. It would look like two hornets in a, in a nest. You guys just..." And I, he said, "That's when I lost my risk meter. You know, I have a high risk tolerance. I just that's just me. But uh, I don't encourage people to do it either. As you know, Jordan, if you watch my videos, I always emphasize to make the right choices. Be live through this crazy life I had, but don't." Don't think it's the way to, to go because you might not mm -hmm. survive. But listen, I've been stabbed, shot. I was stabbed twice, shot, you know, car accidents and uh, operations and hit with a bat. And you don't want to try this life. It's, it's, it, it's crazy, you know, but it sure does make a good YouTube channel. <laughs> so you're a great earner for the mob at this point, right? You're kicking money up and you're knocking off more and more jewelry stores. Because is it just like the first one was so profitable, you said, well, geez, this is easy. I'm just going to keep going and find a few more of these and keep doing it. That That's exactly right. Matt, actually, what happened was I started doing other things as well. The money was starting to come in, so I did other things with the money. Ended up investing in clubs, uh, you know, loan sharking money was a big profit of mine. Then I'd rob other things. I, I had a bookmaking operation, so I would get guys in and they'd owe me money. And before you know it, he's a warehouse manager, so we can't afford his bills. We robbed the warehouse. He lets us in the warehouse. I robbed a whole warehouse for plumbing, plumbing supplies. And they never knew they were robbed. The warehouse was the size of a football field. And they never even knew they were robbed. But I was making money, so you talk about earner. But the jewelry, you're right. I mean, after I made that kind of money in one hit, I said, wait a minute. I got to keep doing this. I mean, this is just too much money. And I was always about the money, though, Jordan. I wasn't about, I, I wasn't a drug addict doing it. I liked the power and the money. I mean, let's face it, the both both of those things are, are very addicting. And uh, that's what most people go for in life. But obviously, they should go the right way. And that's what I always emphasize in my videos as well. You said never rob anything you can't get rid of and always have a plan to move the goods. I assume you learned that the hard way, right? I mean, just sitting on some stolen stuff for weeks or months at a time seems dangerous. Yeah, exactly. Matter of fact, you know, we used to rob trucks and stuff at airports. And uh, we once had – we had some – electronic gear we couldn't even get rid of you so you're selling it for nothing and then the risk is too high and i learned that lesson there but and it was funny because it it it, it bode me well when i i had a guy i was in charge of a security guard company and uh, i had a guy go from where i was to the miami convention center he was gone and he calls me he says larry he goes i got all these picassos i got picassos rembrandts you want them you want to rob them I got the, you know, we could set this up easy. It's a done deal. So what the first thing I do is not say, yeah, let's rob it. I mean, what am I going to do with all these pictures? I call New York. I couldn't get three cents on the dollar. Three cents. So if I rob a million-dollar picture, what are you going to get? I couldn't get 30000 bucks for a million dollars. 10% is, is 100000 I couldn't get that. I couldn't get 3%. Am I going to take, you know, the heat you're going to get for robbing stuff like that? Every person. And then where do you get rid of it? That's the key. You couldn't get rid of it. It's too famous to steal, right? Well, right. it's it's not just too famous. You don't have the connections. There are, I'm sure there's, listen, there's bias for everything out there. Maybe some eccentric billionaire in, in Spain that puts it in his basement and goes down there and jacks off to it. I don't know. But there are some sick people out there that, you know, that do crazy stuff. But... I don't know, Jordan. I was, listen, in my criminal career, what I learned is you get it, you get rid of it, and you get the money, and goodbye. 
You don't hold things. You're not a retailer. You know, you're a wholesaler. You want to want to listen. I, the one thing I always say I should have did. I robbed so much jewelry in my life, probably 15, 18 million. I should have taken this, some of that percentage and opened a store in Rodeo Drive in California, my own store. And reset it, redo it, do everything I'm going to do, and I could have. It would have been worth fifty million today, mm -hmm. you know, the best. And I had the money, I had everything to do it. And it just, it was. I was too much of a fast and loose guy. I was too much of a criminal. I didn't think positive. I mean, everything I thought about. I had a, such a good business brain with loan shark and bookmaking and getting clubs and burning them out and doing certain things, but I wasn't a legitimate thinker in business. I made a lot of money, but I made it the illegal way. And it was always with tilt of that illegal. Now, of course, obviously you do everything illegal. You pay your taxes, you do this, you get your permit from the city, you do everything you're going to do. But that's just the difference now compared to it was when I was running wild. You learned a lot about diamonds, and this is before internet. How did you self-teach about gemstones? Because you, know you ever see that movie Catch Me If You Can? Yes. You ever see that movie? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah, yeah. what? You know when Frank Abagnale, Leonardo DiCaprio, he gets caught by Tom Hanks and he goes, all right, how'd you cheat on the bar exam? And he goes, I didn't cheat. I studied for it. This is what this reminds me of. Like, you know, Internet, like, you know, you became an expert in the gems, which is kind of, first of all, why did you do that? Why was that important? Don't you just take everything that's shiny and sparkly at a diamond in a diamond heist? You don't have to worry about it, right? No, no, I did become an expert. Matter of fact, it's funny. It's one of my fans... Uh, on my Discord, I have a Discord fan fan whole thing. I don't know, ten thousand people. This is crazy. It's, it's growing like weeds. He's a jeweler. He's an actual jeweler. He's a young, twenty three year old young guy, and he's a jeweler. And his grandfather was eighty three, and they're in the trade still. And I went. I was telling him just the other night, Jordan. I went to the GIA. It's called the Gemological Institute of America to learn about diamonds, and I did that under the table, and I paid ten grand. And because I didn't want to get screwed. And, you know, it, when you have that criminal mind, you're always thinking, who's going to screw you? How are they going to screw you? How are they going to get over? You got to be one step ahead of people. Well, you know, when you're, when you're divvying up jewelry and you've got a million dollars of jewelry on a table and you want to know what it's worth, besides some stupid tag that means nothing, totally nothing. The biggest criminals are the jewelers. And uh, when you look at it, you want to have an idea of what it's worth, how clean it is, what it is, what watch is worth, whether it's a Breitling or this watch or a Rolex, whatever, and, and why it makes them tick, what makes them worth so much money, what types of jewelry does it, you know, can it be taken out, can it be, you know, the gold melted, and the, and the piece reset because all signature pieces have to do that. So I wanted to know all about that because I didn't want to get screwed by people that, that are criminals just like me. And I never was. I got lucky with some very good people. I don't know where they are. They never went to jail. Maybe they got lost or something. I don't know. But nobody's doing the crime that was happening. So, And mm. that's, that's what happened. So, I, you know, I'm the only, I'm one of the only ex-felons in the whole world, in the United States at least, who went away on a RICO Act alone. Can you explain a little bit about what that is? I mean, that's the Organized Crime Racketeering Act. What, what, do you, what do you mean you're one of the only felons that went away on that alone? RICO is Racketeering Influence Corruption Organization. That's the, mm -hmm. that, that came out in the 1970s to get mobs, just to get the higher-ups right. so they can get them. Well, you have to have other people that are your, you know, your co-defendants or at least the people who, you work, who work for you that are testifying or something happening because it's an organization. How am I the only one that goes away under the RICO Act alone? Because I wouldn't rat. I wouldn't tell on anybody. And I had a partner who was John Rodriguez. I don't know who John Rodriguez is. There's probably 100,000 John Rodriguez's in Miami. In fact, this isn't even a secret. In 19, 2001, the federal, I'm in prison already since 1996. The federal government charges me with the same exact charge as they charged Bill Clinton. 18 U.S.C. 1001, which is filing a false statement. I said my partner was John Rodriguez. They they took me to trial and proved that I was lying. 
And I ended up getting another 12 months, run concurrent. But that's a great, funny story of how that happened. But um, it just because I wouldn't tell who my partner was. Huh. So, you, so oh, I see. So they just leaned on you for that. You, were you getting a thrill for from robbing? Or was it just like, oh, I don't really like doing this, but it's paying the bills really well? Or, or was there like, were you kind of hooked on it? Oh, it is a, it's a it's an amazing high, Jordan. I've done every drug in the book. There was no drug better than walking out of that store with X amount of dollars of diamonds. And not only that, there were some people who I robbed. I, I'd robbed today. They were just they were trying to rob me as a customer, literally. And I said in the back of my head, "He don't know he's getting robbed." But it, they were trying to rob you, and there was total high that was just like you want i used to always want to be a fly on the wall jordan see how long it took them to get out see how long it took the cops to figure out what happened see what they did but of course i wouldn't that's like being a fire you know arsonist and watching your fire burn you know those guys get caught all the time yeah they do because they always watch the fire <laughs> they always do um i i rem the side note, I caught I caught a couple arsonists in Detroit back when I was helping with the fire department. We had something called Devil's Night. I think it's pretty much only a Detroit thing. It's a day before Halloween, and people go around and burn lots of things down, which is not so much a thing anymore, but we used to catch arsonists all the time. They would burn down abandoned or old buildings, and they were always around. Whenever we'd see a fire, the firemen would come, and me and this volunteer organization, we would go around looking, and, and uh, people would say, what are you doing? That guy's long gone. And we'd say, hell no. This was not an insurance job. This is a, because this is a, you know, this is a neighborhood or it's a thrill seeker. So like just the way they did it, the cops would go, it's, it's a thrill seeker. So we would find somebody standing on the roof or sitting in another place looking at it. Of course, the problem is a lot of people are watching a fire, but you could, it's the crazy guy who smells like gasoline. That's the guy who did it. They're not too hard to find. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, obviously I was a professional, didn't do that. I got caught by just good police work i mean just mm -hmm. you can't can't knock that the fbi is the best there is don't let anybody kid you they got more money and more resources and they're all educated and they all know what they're doing some local cops are pff, come on let's face it look what's going on they can't get cops period to be workers today so how much do you think these guys are really that into their jobs where they're that good with a budget to do what they want so they don't even have the yeah. budget, you know, to fly here, to do this kind of testing, to do this. The FBI, psh, don't play with them. It's like I tell people also with judges. You want to tell a prosecutor to go fuck himself, that's one thing. You want to tell the cop to go fuck himself. Don't tell a judge to that. That guy could put you in jail, period. And and I've seen it happen. I watched the judge tell a kid who was who cursed at the judge. He was supposed to get 18 months in prison. Judge gave him 10 years. Ooh. Now, now, the guy won it. He won his appeal, but it took him three years to win his appeal. Yeah, so he was. It. He, uh, was it worth it? Obviously not. I mean, that's just stupidity. Um, bite your tongue, man. Just get your ego in check. I tell tell that all the time. How do you pick the target for a robbery? And business owners, pay attention here because you didn't just go, "Hey, there's a jewelry store. Let's rob it." You obviously there's some criteria for which ones are going to be the easiest to knock off, right? Oh, absolutely, Jordan. Uh, I mean, I would case a thousand stores before I picked the one I want. I mean, I'd go to a mm -hmm. city and it'd be hundreds. I, I, I can't even probably count how many I actually cased because I'll go around to a whole city or an area I'm in and I'll eliminate some right off the bat because they did certain things. And I often talk about what jewelry owners could do to prevent a professional like me. And uh, then... There's, a, there's two types of robberies. There's a professional like me, and then there's the smash and grab. Mm -hmm. Those guys are, you know, they're not going to get anything but a watch that's in the display counter, and there's ways to prevent that. But the guy like me is the hard guy, is the guy that's watching him for weeks and knowing who's coming, who's going, what time they're going, uh, what time they open, who opens, even what routes they take home. What are some of the things that, that – grow? Uh, we don't have to go into the full workup because that is on your channel, but what are some of the things that business owners can do that you think, why don't they do this obvious thing or not so obvious thing to keep out burglars? Like, what's the deal? You know, uh, I did a whole show on that, and uh, there's so many ways they can just prevent the professional this. You could put up a double-way mirror, meaning uh, even if I think it's a double-way mirror, 
it'd be great. Or you could put up a, a, a sign, one sign right in the store, off-site monitor, 24-hour off-site video monitoring. If I saw that, I don't know if somebody's on their monitor and sees me come in and then once I'm done, it's on. I used to take the tapes out of the the VCRs back then or whatever it was that they were recording the uh, the video on. Today, it's all streaming. So all you got to do is let the criminal know. You want to prevent robberies, Jordan. You don't want to just catch them. Catch them right. is great, but you want to prevent them. I often tell people, you know, you should go to anybody who has a home. I don't care. I don't care. Apartment. Go to Home Depot. Buy this gadget. costs $15, and it's the best home alarm system you'll ever buy. All it is is a beam of light that goes across your door at a certain height. If that door or somebody breaks in or comes through that door, that alarm screeches like, you know, a really, really loud screech. And that's all you want because you want them to run away. You don't want them to go, oh, let's silent, let's get them on tape while he stabs you, you know, right, kills yeah. somebody. You know, don't do that. Get rid of the perpetrator, you know, get rid of the, the criminal. So if you put a sign up in a store that said 24-hour off-site monitoring, you know, Bell security systems, you know, best in America, whatever bullshit you want to say. I don't know if it's true or not. I'm not going to play with it. You don't want to have a display case in the front window that a person from the outside can't see in. I love that you go to those stores and they got a beautiful display case. I said, this is great. It's perfect for me in the store. Nobody can see in. They don't know what I'm doing in the store. They don't know who's in that store unless they oh, walk Oh, I see. In. So the display case prevents people from seeing through the window. You want right. people to be able to see you robbing the place from the street. Right. It gives me a lot more caution to do the place. I, I would do robberies when the sun was coming up or the sun hit the glass at the right time because you can't see in. I didn't do it mm. when it was a cloudy day or or it could have been a cloudy day, but the way the light or the way the glass on that place looked, it had to be perfect. And that's that's easy fixes. I mean, you should alternate way you go to go to work. You know, you get in such a groove of employees. They go the same way. They park in the same spot. They do everything, Jordan. And it, it makes it so easy for me because now I know who's there. I just go by and see the car and I'll go by multiple times in a day. And it makes it easy. If I have a delivery, I would stagger my deliveries. You call the, the F, uh, what is it called, FedEx or UPS and say, listen, on Tuesdays, I want to be delivered by, you know, for after 1 p.m. Uh, on Wednesdays and one whatever it is, I want deliveries in the mornings. Because that would throw somebody looking at your store and say, man, when are they coming? I don't know when they're coming. I got to know. And there's little things like that you can do. And, and of course, never... Uh, the display cases should be obviously certain, not only locked, but you shouldn't put more jewelry out than necessary. You shouldn't go to a place where you hide your good jewelry because I'm watching that. So little things like that. They also have buzzers in their pocket now. Be ready to go at all times. And and that's an alarm. It's silent alarm. But so, the, you know, there's different ways to secure a jewelry store. And there's so many more I can go in. I can probably go down a whole – I was just did a, a TV uh, – uh, for a jewelry robbery magazine, I did a piece. And it was about how to prevent robberies and from starting when you get up in the morning, what to do, all the way and through a, a full day. And there's multiple things you can do. Now – uh, this is this is fascinating because I think a lot of people wouldn't expect you to. They they go, oh, he's looking for the place where all the jewels are out. The minute detail of waiting for the glare to be right on the window so that people couldn't see in from the street because that gives you a 10, 15 minute window of just putting stuff in a in a backpack or whatever and running out. Um, it just makes it impossible for other people to see that type of detail that I assume is what separates you from those idiots that crash the car through the front door, get out, they're smashing all the cases. They got a bunch of cut glass and, and, and Rolexes or whatever watches low end ones in a bag. And then they run out the side door and get on like a, a Two, what are those, a tiny little scooters, and then they're cruising somewhere, and it's like, look for three dumbasses on a scooter with a backpack that has glass parts falling out the back because there's a hole in it. Like, you see these guys on, on uh, YouTube, and you just go, these people have either never robbed anyone before, or they have just been lucky as hell so far. 
Well, you got you got two things. Like uh, what you're saying is the professional like myself is going to really plan it and have a getaway and do everything I know I need to be done. And when I say needs to be done, I mean so I'm not detected until a point when you know you are. But what you were talking about is just smash and grab, usually drug addicts. But there is one gang around the whole world right now called the Pink Panther Gang. They are notorious. I haven't heard from them in a while, but they've done some brazen, brazen robberies, uh, and they're known. It's called, and, But they're very organized. They're not the smash and grabs. They come in hard, but they know what they're doing. They know where the stuff is. They know where the safe is. They know how to get to it. They know what they, they know what they're doing. They're not the smash and grab. The smash and grab, you're right. It's the guy that just runs in on a scooter, smash a couple of glass, gets in. You're going to get what you're going to get. Like you said, low-end shit because who's going to put the best there? And then you're going to you know, be eventually caught because you're going to make this so many mistakes today to be made. And, you know, someone asked me, hey, Larry, how would have you liked to live in the 1920s? And I thought, wow, think about no... The things I think about is no <laughs> fingerprints, no DNA, no cameras, no just the guy with the fastest gun wins, I guess. But it was kind of like today technology. But it's so funny because even when they had technology when I was around, I beat it. So if there's technology, there's a way around it. And there's a way around anything. It's the will of the people is what it is. That's what <laughs> all it is, the will. And if you got the will, you're Rob. You've got a couple of of rules that I want to go over because these are interesting. One of which was uh, how do you pick the target? You had a couple rules behind that. One, though, was never rob a place just because you need money quick. Why not? I mean, isn't that why a lot of people rob places? That's the drug addict thing we were just talking about, the smash and grab, right? It it leads to that kind of sloppy execution. Yeah, that goes for all of them. Bank robbers. I I knew professional bank robbers. Professionals. Got away 50 Mm -hmm. banks. And then I knew the guys who did it once or twice and they got away with it and did it with a note or whatever and they were just hard up and that's just the way it was. It, those were the kind of guys that are going to get caught nine at, not, 99 out of 100 times they're going to get caught. And and they probably need to get caught to get their addictions done or whatever help they're going to need because the professional is the guy that th- it's doing it for a living. The guy that... that says, wait, I'm raising a family on this. I got to know what I'm doing. Uh, mm-hmm. And it, and if he does, then it, and if they're smart, again, listen, I was told by a buddy of mine, says, Larry, you know what, how many percentage of people who are like you? Zero. I go, what do you mean? I am one. He goes, okay, one. He goes, think of that million people you see, how many of them done what you did in everything you've done and even survived it. And now you're an honorary cop. And, and and you're recognized on the floor of the United States Congress and all the guys. There's nobody. He goes, that's what makes you so interesting and why your YouTube channel is blowing up. But it, it made sense when I started thinking about it's not just that I did it. It's, uh, again, I'm a, more of a workaholic, I think, and I follow my heart a lot. I saw a lot of bad things in prison. That's why I'm I'm very big as a prison advocate and I'm not a supporter in like the sheriff where I live who wants to put kids in jail for pot, for pot. Mm-hmm. He literally said to me, he says, all those kids in the jail, they all started on pot. Pot's the big evil. Are you kidding me? You got to, you know, and you wonder why cops are vilified. How do you set up the heist? We talked a little bit about what you look for, um, planning uh, in the beginning as well. Are you staying, you're not robbing everything around yourself, right? You're going to another town, you're, what, checking into a motel, you stay there for 10 days and start looking at the stores? How does it How does it work? Well, it depends. First of all, you're right. First thing is you find an area you want to be in. Once you're in that area, then you, what the, I call mobile case, which means run around in a car and finding it. I'm already not looking at, at the value what's in the store yet. I'm first looking at if a store could be done. And what I mean by that, does the store, you know, does the sun rise in the, you know, the sun rises in the east and falls in the west is the face of the store east. So I know when the sun rises in the morning or when it, or is it facing west? So when the sun comes down, I'll be doing the store later in the afternoon. Is there mm. uh, something in front of the store? What's next to the store? I'm not going to rob a police sta- a store that's next to the police station, obviously, or, or something that. But it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't matter. The best stores I used to like to rob were in plazas with Winn Dixies or Publixes, 
or grocery hmm. stores because Why? there's a lot of people coming and going. So it's easy hmm. for me to sit in my car and watch that store without being a suspect. Oh, what's he doing? He's waiting for his wife to uh, you know, come from the store. He's reading the paper. And you're watching the store. Then you go and once you find that part of it, that's the outside case. Then it's the inside case. And then you go into multiple stores. You ask certain questions. Uh, my questions were, hey, I'm in the area. And uh, I 10 years ago, I used to be a uh, a small contractor. Now I'm a you know wealthy. He sees my Rolex. He sees all the money. I You know, nice clothes. And then he looks and I said, yeah, I'm looking to upgrade my wife's ring to about a two carat, really good ring. Uh, you know, my budget's anywhere between 10 and 20,000, maybe more if it's right. I'm in the area. I'm a builder or whatever it is. And he says, oh, oh, let me hold on. And he might go get a box of diamonds. He can mm. bring that box of diamonds out, all loose cut diamonds. I, Jordan, would look at that box and I can calculate the value of that box after he pulls two rings, two pieces. I, I'll ask him for a two carat ring. Depending on the box where he pulls that, I'm watching. Now, and then I'll say, well, how about a little smaller? Depending on which way he goes on that box, I can pretty much give you a good estimate of how much that box is going to be worth to me. Could be worth 300,000, you know, 250, 500, or whatever it is. And I always watch where they put it. Because a lot of times, Jordan, they won't put that box of diamonds back. It doesn't go in a safe. It goes in a false floorboard in the office or another safe in the office. Not the big safe that's right out in the open. They all show. You know, that's kind of like they put stuff in it. It's a great safe and all that. But some of this other stuff is kept out of there, you know, mm. in another hidden spot. But they're not slick enough to, you know, get a guy like me. And while I'm in there, I'm looking where the cameras are. I'm looking at where the other employees are, how many employees there are. And then I'm looking at uh, where the uh, buttons might be on the counters. There's so many multiples in the store. So you do the outside case first, then you do the inside. And while you're in that inside, I'm telling you the value. I usually rob wholesalers. That means jewelers that sold to other jewelers. Because they had I, better, they had more stones and more better stones, stones or whatever. Sure, more stones, more loose stones, more uh, quality stuff. And I, I pretty much stayed away from the chain stores, the Zales, the Mayors, those kind of things, because they have a, a one central location, and they bring stuff there. And if you want it, they have to call. It's a whole different animal than 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 a real jeweler, I call it. Gotcha. Okay, so the money is in the loose stones, not in like the. No, ready-made no, stuff. No, 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 no. Money's everywhere. Money's everywhere. Okay. Depending on what it is. Obviously, the gold is worth money. I mean, you can get even mm -hmm. get penny weight on gold, but it doesn't matter. And some signature, but you, like diamond earrings, they're already set and they're pretty much studs, whether a carrot or a carrot and a half. They can, might be a gorgeous set of stud earrings. That's just because they're not loose doesn't make them. Obviously, loose made it easy to sell. Oh, know? okay. But but yeah. How long does it take to plan each? heist you know is it like a few days is it like a month or is it like you can do it in the afternoon no 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 it's anywhere from probably two weeks to a month okay so that's a that's a lot of sitting in parking lots is that the majority of the time is like watching the place well once you get the place that's part of it that that could take days and days weeks even depending on where you're at and how many you have to go in and you, then you nix them at the end because something happened. It was wrong. You thought you were noticed. Like you said, where do you stay? We always paid cash and never left the room. So we weren't the motel, out. Like a motel room? Well, like, yeah, cheap hotel room or cheap garbage one or camping. One time I went camping. I, 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 think I did videos <laughs> on that. Uh, That's so funny. But, uh, yeah, so we we stayed inconspicuous. Uh, we didn't go out to bars and places and, oh, look at these three guys walking around or two guys, you know, who are they, whatever. Didn't do anything like that. Even the car we had, you know, I didn't want it to be spotted or the plate to get a ticket or anything of that nature in the area. So you don't want to mess with that. And then during the robbery, we had fake plates. But uh, and you'd rob get plate. fake plates. What you just steal another car's plates and put yeah. them on the car? Yeah, okay. some some car in that kind of not not like that vicinity, like that kind of car. So let's just say it was, you know, it could be a, off a truck, 
And then, you know, somebody get the plate numbers. They go, yeah, it's, he's on this plate number. They look it up real quick, and it's a truck. They go, oh, fuck, now they're looking for a truck? Okay. <laughs> but, you know, they don't know. It would be opposite color of the car, stuff like that, of the plate. But it, those are the little things so to take. And, and then when after you get the diamonds, after you complete the robbery, then it's the process of getting rid of the stuff. And within 24 hours, I had rid of all my stuff. Oh, wow. So you fence it right away. Oh, yeah. I used to I make my phone calls on the way up, and I'd have them add, and we would incinerate our clothes, incinerate uh, all the labels and boxes and everything else that was taken. It'd be all gone and down into a bag. And once it was there, the you know, the negotiation, if you want to call it, started. Interesting. Okay. And, and, I heard something about you looking up how many cops were in the police department or something like that. Can you tell me about that strategy? That was kind of an interesting sure. technique. Uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. Depending on the area you're in and depending on, uh, like, you're not usually in big cities. You're in smaller places. So you look at the number of police. I mean, you could take, just let's give an example. My, I live in, well, where we are right now, we live in a city called Rockledge. I think their police departments have about 60 cops, not even, maybe not even that. I think less than that. And now, how many cops you think could be on the road? If you got, if you just go look it up, you can look it up. It's public knowledge. So you can say, okay, that Rockledge has got, you know, three shifts and, uh, you know, six cops, eight cops on a shift. If you saw two of them over here, you know, what, what, what's the odds? Where are they? And it's easy to pick them out and actually find out where they are. In fact, I used to, I used to like I've taken a Molotov cocktail, threw it in air to see how quick it took the cops to get there. And uh, once the cops got there, you know how many cops are in the area because this is how many cops can go to your robbery quick enough to get you. Oh, so, interesting. So you're using, I guess that's not misdirection. It's just more like a. No, uh, it's kind of like, like a a test. a test run, right? A test run where they don't know what's going on. And, you know, they, they're just in their own worlds, cops. I mean, they're no different than anybody else. They're supposed to be alert, supposed to be, but are they? They're talking about this, that, thinking about the game. I get it. I, I am curious. When you go into the store and you're casing the store, you're acting like a normal customer. You're saying you're a contractor. You want to upgrade your wife's ring. Are you worried that... This might just be some movie stuff, but like, are you worried that you're leaving prints and that those people can see you and recognize you, or is that not really a concern at that point? Not a concern at that point. Uh, I don't touch anything. Uh, not only that, I alter my p appearance. I don't alt. I don't put mm -hmm. the disguise on, but I alter my appearance. I uh, might not have a mustache or a, a goatee. I always had one, so I'd, it'd be clean shaven. Or my hair. I had hair. <laughs> it would be part <laughs> parted a different way in a different color. So, I mean, I just did little things. And, and you should have seen some of the descriptions. Red hair, five foot seven, 300 pounds. I've had six foot four. I'm five nine to, uh, back then I was five nine to, to 10 maybe or whatever. But I've had all these crazy descriptions. I used to laugh at those in the paper. And it just goes to show you how off the uh, eyewitness descriptions are. It just they're, they're mm -hmm. so unreliable. They're proven that many times, though. So I'm surprised they weren't like he was an African American male, yeah. seven feet tall. Yeah, it, it it eyewitness testimony is notoriously inaccurate. So there's no big surprise there at all. And and so okay, so you go in when you are executing this, you know what you're going to take when you get in, right? Because you only want to steal stuff worth stealing. It seems like you could. Oh no no! You didn't no, know no. what you were doing. No no no! I I emptied the no? whole store. The whole store was You emptied the whole store. Oh, really? Okay, because I've store. heard other thieves be like, just steal what's worth stealing. Don't don't take everything. So you just you're just like, screw that. When you go to a jewelry store, Jordan, it's all worth stealing. I'm it's not, all I mean, worth stealing. You know, come on. I even had a, a it's a funny thing on my YouTube channel. I used to take a clock. I don't know. I'm just you know, it's one of these From the store. Know, yeah, like you know, like a they'd have like a little small antique clock or a little something. I just took it. I don't know what it was about that. I just took them. And I always took a clock out of a store. I don't know if it was symbolizing time or something. I don't know in my own head. But I emptied every shelf and the safe and the back room. So, yeah, I got everything. And you took the security system tape so they'd have no footage right, right out back of the VCR. Then, 
back then I would take the tape. They, they, uh, it, I, at times I couldn't open the tape. I'd take the whole machine. So, yeah, that's faster. Uh, yeah, I would just um, rip it out, literally, and take the whole machine. Uh, you ever see Home Alone, that movie? Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The wet bandits where they turn the faucets on? So your thing was the clock. Yeah, it was kind of weird. And, and it was not because of that, because I was robbing before that movie. But yeah, it was kind of weird. I, I took, I loved clocks, and there'd be some nice, like you know, diamond encrusted clocks on the, you know, some they're selling or something. And it was just, I always grab the clock, and 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 they're bulky to a degree. I mean, some of them are smaller, but I wouldn't rob a clock like a, a grandfather clock or something like sure, that. Sure, yeah, yeah. It was something I could <laughs> put in a bag, but it was just my thing. I don't know what it was. It was crazy. Where are the clocks now? Oh, I'm sure I gave them away for gifts for everybody in the world. Oh, okay. So there's like somebody at home is like, I got a clock as a gift and it's covered in diamonds. I wonder if this is real. He gave it to me for my bar mitzvah. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I, I gave a lot of stuff away. So uh, jewelry. So there's some stuff people have out there for sure. I guess it's better than getting caught with a bunch of stolen clocks, which would be super embarrassing. That'd be a bad way to go, eh? You know, I never got caught in a store. And thank, thank God, and uh, never got caught with anything. So that's another good thing. Yeah. Uh, but you know the close calls, all that kind of stuff. But that's just that's the nature of the beast in whatever you do. You know, I you I, know, and there is risk in any, everything you do. I don't care what it is. It's just a matter of what kind of risk. That's all it is. Did you? I heard that a lot of times people will plan things backwards, right? Like they plan the getaway first and then work backwards. Is there any? wisdom in that oh yeah absolutely i mean i used to make sure i can get away with it before i even did it so uh and i mean you plan it to a degree backwards i mean if i had to alternate a little road here or there to go out and, and knew it was safe i would still do it but i knew my getaway beforehand so yes you do work backwards in its own way because because what good is robbing something if you can't if you don't get away with it mm -hmm. i mean it, that just defeats the purpose you know, the goal is to get out, and you might get less, but you're out. You know, you want to optimize everything you're going to do. So you, you had your plan. That's why I said when I'm looking at the store and seeing if nobody could see in me and what the getaway plan is, how, does the back entrance have a way to get out when no one will see you and you can get another three-minute head start or whatever it is. They don't know what direction you went in. So there's all of those things come into play when you're when you're casing a store how long are you inside the actual store oh one store you're in there it depends uh 10 minutes sometimes i was in one okay. store about 20 20 something minutes it was a cop car waiting out front not for me he was just waiting out front for something else <laughs> and then i'm going up to the door get the fuck out of here you know what i mean and he was just talking to people and whatever then he finally left i gave him another minute and then i walked out Wow. Oh, so you were just waiting him out with a bunch of stolen right. merchandise it, in bag, the store. Bags of bags, three pillowcases of jewelry. Oh, that must have been nerve wracking. And he's sitting there like opening up his coffee, looking at his scratch off lottery tickets. You're like, why? Why here? <laughs> yes. Something like that. It wasn't. Yeah. He was talking to people and I'm like, what? Well, get out of here. Just get out of here. Person walked down the street. He talked to him. Like, get the fuck out of here. And I'm and all the stuff is waiting at the back door, you know, ready to go out because I didn't want to have to go out. And then I don't know. He's right there. And then it would have been, oh, shit. You know, you that would have been a close call. So there's no alarms going off like when you break the cases or. OK, gotcha. I, f I figured if you were breaking I didn't break anything, the case. Like there was an alarm, you never break, broke anything. No, no. I opened it with a key. Yeah, that seems easier. Yeah, Why break it? That's. I mean, yeah, I, avoid I, yeah, the alarm, right? Avoid getting cut. Why everything? Why just open this up, take it out, put it in a bevel case, and goodbye? You know, it, it's not, again, that's not rocket science, that part of it. It's obviously. Uh, planning it the, the rocket science comes in with the, the picking of the place planning the place and having the outs and everything else but in inside is pretty cut and dry i had plans you go here you go here you take these cases you take these cases i got the safe and i got the person and i got the back rooms and we're done in you know maybe seven minutes ten five minutes seven minutes ten minutes whatever it's going to be 
And, you know, how many people, if somebody walks at the door, what do we do? Who goes and gets it? You know what I mean? Because if a person walks in, they're in on a robbery, and I put them down too, you know? And put, I used to use flex cuffs and put them down. Like so. zip ties, right? Like plastic right. handcuffs? Right, right, exactly. Zip ties. What is it? It's not. Is it just you, or like who else is working with you? You got a crew with you, or or no? I, I had a crew with me. Two other guys. Uh, okay. And how do you pick those guys? Well, that that's the problem. Yeah, you better know them better than you know yourself. Yeah. Uh, and, and I did. I knew them both. Uh, one was my brother. That's not a secret. And he ended up going to prison. The other one is he ended up passing away. Uh, not now. He passed away of cancer when I well when I got out. But when he's about five years ago now, I think he died of cancer. And uh, so he was the other one. So, yeah, you can't really just pick some schmo off uh, from the bar like to go do this with you because you need to be able to trust that they're going to come through on everything and not flip on you, right? Well, yeah, it's not even a flip. Yeah, first of all, you have to panic. You know, I tested one time one person and he couldn't do it. He ended up uh, panicking. But I had a backup. I'm not going to be stupid and just trust someone on a, on a major job without having a backup. And he did. He panicked. People, you know, it takes a lot of balls to do what we did. That's number one. And once it's a go, it's a go. It's not like, oh, shit, maybe I can't do it. No, it's a go. And oh, so what What happened? He just wouldn't go and do it? Or was he the, the driver? It, nope. He was in there. He was, yeah, he was supposed to bring the car around back on a single. And he panicked and left. But I had a, <laughs> I had an alternate plan. He's lucky he didn't get killed either. But yeah, he had. A, yeah. Well, I had an alternate plan that worked out well. So, in in heist movies, they always show the brains of the operation, right? That would be you in this case conducting a meeting <laughs> where they go over the plan, right? There's a whole like there's a whiteboard and they're in a basement. Is that just a device they use in film to explain the robbery, or is there like a meeting you guys have where you're like, all right, this is the you know, this is the A-team plan where there's, like, little chess no, pieces. No, no, no. There is a plan, and there is meeting, and there's a lot of talking, and there's a lot on the way, on the way back, uh, a lot of communication, a lot of it to calm nerves, but a lot of beating into the people what their job is, but it's no, nothing written down. You don't write down anything and then, oh, okay, let, let me, why, why don't I just get a diary then and keep the cops really informed? But... Uh, <laughs> There's nothing written. It's it's right here. It's in my head, and I'm pointing mm -hmm. to my head. <laughs> but it's right in my head who's got to do what, where they got to go, who timing, and if I say go. And I'm I'm forever pounding it into them, you know, what to do, what to do. You got the right side. You got the left. When we go in, don't move. You know, if anybody moves, I got them. You know, don't go there. Don't go here. You just keep doing what you're doing. We got to get out in this amount of time. If the alarm goes off, we're going. We're on a go. So that means you go. Just if the alarm goes, get ready, and we all hit the door, and we hit the get you know getaway car, and we're done. But you pound that into people. You don't. That's like training. It's like it's like any kind of baseball team or anything. You train for that. You are pounding it into him, so it's second nature that he does what you ask him to do. Are you yelling at the people in the store to do what you they you need them to do, or are you be, being calm when you're in the store? Oh, me, I'm being calm. I'm I'm very calm. Oh, when I originally jump in, when I first take him down, it's. Get down, get down, on the floor, on the floor. When I jump over the counter, it, it, it it's pretty intense. But after that initial thing, there ain't a sound in the store. It's quiet. I mean, it's okay. Don't open your eyes. Keep your, keep your head down. Look to the wall. Don't open your eyes. Close your eyes. We'll let you know. Blah, blah. And they're tied up already. Oh, right, because you've got the flex cuffs and everything. Right. I never like, gagged somebody. I never gagged them. I don't want anybody to choke or anything like that. Oh, yeah, I was going to say. It doesn't seem that harmful. But, yeah, I guess somebody could choke uh, on something. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I, I Was there ever – I mean, people must have been scared to death in there. Did you ever run into anybody who tried to be, like, a brave guy or anybody who just didn't understand what was going on? Uh, Well, not really. I ran into – yeah, I ran into a guy. This was funny. I was robbing a jewelry store in uh, South Florida, and – they, they had a, I ended up having like seven, eight people, maybe 10 people. I don't know. So many people I ran out of flex cuffs. 
But or the last, I couldn't do their feet. I used to do their feet and hands. I ended up having only do their feet. So this one guy was just talking shit. Like, oh, man, what are you, yeah, this is bullshit. You're right. And I'm thinking, is this guy a cop or something? Who the fuck is this guy? I go up to him and I take out his wallet. And he's not a cop. He's a nobody. And I take his jewelry off. He had a, he had a, uh, like a, a, a chain, a gold chain band around his thing. And I look, and it was fake. And I started laughing. I says, you fagazi motherfucker, shut your fucking mouth. He was trying to, and the, and the two clerks that, you know, the, the employees started laughing because this guy, I guess, used to come in and try to think he was a big shot and he wasn't a big shot. And they started laughing and I just started crying. He shut up and it was so funny. Oh, man. So he's he's over there flexing, and you're like, you're not even wearing a real gold right. bracelet. Right. Yeah, yeah. I said, you <laughs> fucking fagazi. You fagazi, meaning, you know, fake. I said, fagazi is a, is a term for something that's fake. I said, you fake fagazi fuck. I said, oh, you shut your fucking mouth. And it, and I, it was so funny. Uh, the girl started laughing. Oh, was it funny? Now, obviously, cash is the best because you don't need a fence to, to sell it, but... Cash is super heavy. I guess there's not enough cash to be too heavy in a, in a robbery, right? At a jewelry store, a few oh, thousand no, no, bucks. No, 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 bullshit. Oh, no, no, not enough. Listen, you could carry a lot of cash. But uh, the biggest robbery, besides the billion-dollar uh, uh, art, jewelry art in Germany, the biggest robbery ever was in France in a hotel room in, in the— in Paris, and they robbed $134 million worth of diamonds. Now, even if they only got 20%, 20%, $134 million is what? $26 million? $130, $128 million? How would you lift up $28 million in cash? Yeah. How, do you know how much that weighs? Yeah, we did it. I don't know what it's like, 70 pounds per, what is it, a million or something? I'm going like to look that. this up right now. Yeah, how you much can look it up. Cash uh, do, do, yeah, look, up, look it up. Uh, do, do it a gram. Uh, a bill weighs a gram. So depending on the bills, obviously, if they're all well, hundred. What was the total? Worth. What was the total amount in hundred? Uh, well, let's assume it's a hundred dollar bills. What was the total one, amount of money? One bill is a gram, and it's a hundred and thirty four million dollars. Okay, that is. You couldn't lift it. The amount of okay, a hundred and thirty four times ten. Oh yeah, so it's that's. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. It's so a million dollars is ten kilos. So okay, I'm going to do this kilo, into pounds. Two point two, so it's twenty five pounds. A million dollars. Yeah, twenty two. So if we do this on the calculator, so you said one hundred and thirty four million. Right. Okay. How so much, it, that's how like three thousand. It's like three thousand pounds of right. cash. That's over a ton. I mean, what are you going to do with that? You, you know, you can't. That's like a pickup truck. Wait. Exactly. I mean, uh, and they walked away with that kind of money and walked away out the door in a briefcase. In a briefcase. Just got up, left, and walked in a briefcase. I, it's, I, I, I was on the news about that for a long time. And uh, I, like I said, he, let's just say for a fact he only got $28 million. What does $28 million weigh? What did you say? It's 25 pounds, 22 pounds a million? It's 22 pounds per million, yeah. So, so 22 times, you said $28 million? Right, 28 times Yeah, I mean, 25. that's still 600 plus pounds, man. Right, you can't lift it. You can't lift no. that. There's no way you no. can't lift that. You know, it's 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 trips and trips or whatever it is. If you had to pick it up in 50-pound bags, 70-pound bags, you know, where are you going to go? How many trips are you going to make? I mean, and... I'm telling you, diamonds was the way to go. But you had to have it out because there's always another man. Obviously, as I always say, cash is king. Because, uh, listen, I wouldn't mind robbing a, 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 a armored car vehicle. Or, you know, I, I knew guys who planned heists on depots, cash depots. where That's where the, where the armored cars pick up their money. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, they have rooms of $20 million in it, $30 million. I mean, now get me a truck and get it all out of there and then get the truck to another place and then then you're done. Then you just lay down for a while. <laughs> but I heard you turned down a $12 million robbery. I did. What happened I, there? 
Well, you know, uh, I'm so glad I did. It worked out that if I did, it would have been a kidnapping. It would have been everything else, and it wouldn't have been a oh, statue of limitations on it, right? Uh, it, anyway, it was a robbery in the Bahiamar, uh not Bahiamar, the, uh, uh, what's the hell? Uh, the, in Doral, not Doral, down on Miami Beach. Wow, I always say I'll never forget. It's the Fo- Oh, the Fountain Blue Hotel. Yeah, I won't forget. Mm-hmm. It was in the Fountain Blue, and it was H. Stern Jewelers. And I planned it, had dynamite built that looked just like dynamite. I was going to put dynamite on the manager to open the store. And he opened it about 20 minutes before the guard came in. And I was going to put dynamite on and go in with him, empty the store, go out. And I was going to have his family being held with dynamite and tell him, if you do anything and you know, you're dead and he don't hear from me, we're going to blow everybody up and we're leaving. If you pull over, you're going to blow him up. I had this thing planned right down to the, I mean, really good. And we were waiting in the bushes of his house once and a dog spotted us. And I I, I called it off right then and there. I said, it's not going to go. Too many variables. And it was the best move I ever made, Jordan, obviously. Yeah. No kidding. You would have ended up. With a lot, and that's a lot of cash to trust people with. Like your brother can probably trust, but still, so much. No, no, that would have been easy. I, I would have had about, I would have got about five million, uh, four million, whatever. I was going to tell him, listen, give me a couple million right up, pay me a million this month, and me and that, you know, the people I know, and get rid of it. That I would, I, I don't think I would have had a problem with the money end of it. That would have been the easy part for me. The harder part for me would have been the, uh, uh, I mean, there's never a statute of limitation then. I never did anything where there's not a statute of limitation. So it's not like uh, I, I murdered somebody and now they're they, they going to get you, you know. Right. There, there's no statute of limitation on me. For people wondering, if, in case you don't know, statute of limitation is how long they can go after you for a crime. So if you rob someone and then, I, or you do some fraud eight years later or whatever the statute of limitation is, then it's like, oh, well, you, you got away with it. It's too late. But things like murder, kidnapping, I think also certain types of... No, treason, it, murder. It's treason, murder, and kidnapping. That's it. That's Most it, of right? others have five years. Most of them are five, not seven. And there's a couple of seven. But there is now a few that child child sex stuff, they've made the statute 10 years and even made some of them 20 so there is some some stat, uh, changes on for that crime, but no robberies or this. And the reason they can get drug dealers for a longer uh, uh, sentence is like, I know a guy who was a drug dealer. He got out of the business, totally out of the business. Now he's been out of the, he was out of the business four years already. A friend calls him and says, "Hey, listen, can I borrow your boat? I got a, a load of dope I want." He goes, "I'm not in that business." He hangs up on the guy, but that phone call kept him in a conspiracy. Just kept him Ooh. in the conspiracy, so the statute because he knew about the crime, right? And the statute of limitation went another five years, and he ended up getting caught and convicted, even though the statute, was, you know, he was out of it. But because he that phone call that continued the conspiracy, and that's what happened to him. Interesting. Yeah, you don't want to mess with the statute of limitation because, of course, the court prosecution is going to look for any nexus, any connection to anything you've done, and it's. You're going to have a hard time finding a judge who goes, well, I like p- getting people off on a technicality where they will never get punished for the things that they've done. They're going to go, all right, you know, if you don't believe it, challenge it all the way up to the Supreme Court if you want to, but you can do it from jail, buddy. Uh, you know? I, that's to a degree. There are judges, especially in the federal system, that are more uh, really law-bound, and you'll see that more in the Fed. The state systems are corrupt because they're all elected. You got to remember that. Mm-hmm. They're elected people which is a bad system because they got to give favors and they got to campaign. They got to do everything that's wrong with the system. Yeah. The federal Judge system. Jordan, tough on crime. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. The, the federal system, once they're appointed, they don't give a fuck who you are. You know? Right. And that's why I don't ever worry about the Supreme Court picks. A lot of people do. But I asked him, I said, let me ask you a question. What about John Roberts? What'd he do? When you get into that position, like he, he, everyone thought he would go with the Obamacare and this or that. He struck it down to when, when you become a Supreme Court judge or a federal judge, you don't answer to anybody, man. I mean, you can't get fired by the president. This guy, Congress, doesn't mean shit. Your real conscience comes in. So, and if you're a constitutionalist judge, you're going to go to buy the Constitution, period. 
Mm -hmm. If you're an activist judge, that's different than you're going to be an activist judge. But if you're a pure constitutional judge, you know, those are the kind of guys that are going to go by their conscience because they don't give a fuck. Now, what they said to get in there and the hearings and all the bullshit that counts, who gives a crap? It's what they do when they're there. And look at look at all the justices, all of them. They've, they've changed in a lot of ways. Every one of them have changed deeply. And it, I was just watching the study on this because of this new, new person, Comey, Comey Barry or whatever her name is, mm -hmm. Amy Comey Barrett. And so I am just was reading a whole bunch of stuff on that, and it makes a lot of sense now. How do people react when they're being robbed? You know, are people freaking out universally, or are there some people that just start crying? Like, what— you know, the one guy was acting tough. What's the usual reaction, and what do you do? You The usual reaction is okay, and they stay silent and stuff. I've seen them laugh. I've seen them cry. Uh, the laughings make me laugh. Uh, That's weird. Cry. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's just a reaction. Nervous laughter. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. And most of them just don't hurt me. And listen, no professional is going to hurt you. you. You're better off getting robbed by a professional than you are by anybody else. Obviously, you shouldn't be robbed. And we're not promoting that on this channel or any channel. Uh, but it's the ones that uh, the people that the people that are, are the most freaked out are the are, are the ones you wouldn't expect it. You know, like the old. Uh, I've seen an old lady say, "Hey, you should get more stuff. This place robbed me." Are you kidding me? You know what I mean? Was, and I'm like, Jesus. And she was in there complaining or something. And I'm like, holy shit. So, I mean, you don't know what the reactions are going to be. And uh, that's just – and and it's kind of weird when the laugh or the, the cry, you try to calm them down. You, anything, you calm them down. So, listen, nothing's going to happen. You just shut up. Don't open your eyes. We'll be out of here in a minute. It's not your shit. I never even took the jewelry off the people. Like, you know, mm. if, he, if he had a wedding ring on or something, I didn't touch it. That was something personal. Now, I'm not yeah. saying if it was in there, I'm sure I did screw up. But, you know, whatever's in the shop is in the shop. But if it wasn't in that shop, it was on that lady's finger. I wasn't ripping her finger off, you know. Yeah. No, I guess that makes sense. Um, I, it seems like you could have done it, but that's just purely conscience, right? Because you could have gotten it. You were getting away with it anyway, right? You just didn't want to do that to the customers? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Could have got away with it. That's not even close. Not, not even thinkable. Yeah, of course I could have. But no, I didn't. No. You get, what, 30% of stuff that you fence? Like, what sort of split do you get when you give it to somebody else who sells stolen goods? Sure, it depends. Uh, you know, that's a rough estimate. It's a good one. Uh, there are certain pieces you'll get 40%. Some you'll get 20%. So, you know, depending on what it is, how hot it is at the time. But a, a, a good pick is 30%, and you'll be right. Man, th those guys take a lot of risk because they're storing stolen stuff after receiving stuff from people who are being chased or investigated. Then they got to sit on it for a while and move it around. And then they got to find somebody to buy it. And then they got to take that money. And then they got to go back to you and give you some money. That's just such a risky gig. No, man. They take they take the diamonds, right? They give you they give you the cash up front. Here's your thirty. Oh, up front. Okay. You got a million dollars. Here's the three hundred thousand. Okay. You got your 300. Now, the, they already have that melted down, taken out. It's being reset. It's like as if they bought diamonds again. You know, it's like they bought a low. And now they put it out and, it, and, that's, and it's maneuvered, you know, and it's sent. I knew a lot of my diamonds went to California, was sent to California. And when it was sent to California, that's what they did. They they moved it out of there. You know what I mean? They got it out of that area. Even And even though, unless, unless it's such a signature piece, then they break them right up, right up. But the, like a regular piece that's nothing, it's a normal, you'll see a thousand of them in a thousand, you know, in two stores, you'll see 25 rings just like that. They're not going to touch that. It's just, it is what it is and it's good. Now, unless it has what they call Lazar Kaplan. Lazar Kaplan are laser cut diamonds. Those have a serial number in them. You know, born. I was wondering about that because they could put that in there on the side so small you couldn't even see it, right? Right. Well, a, a Lazar Kaplan diamond can't be seen but a, except with a 10 power microscope. So uh, the serial number can't be seen, right? Right. On it, you mean? Yeah. 10 powered microscope can't be seen with the naked eye. So it's very important that you, uh, 
you know, you don't rob that because you got caught with that. Now you got caught with a serial number diamond. The other one's hard to prove. They have what they call birth certificates. They're all bullshit. It's all bullshit. It's all freaking diamond game. The diamond game is a big hustle game. Let me tell you. How do you how do you take something and take 80% off? Because it's fucking marked up 100%. I mean, yeah. you know, it, it's just it's a crazy game. I often tell people the biggest mistake people make the third largest purchase you'll ever make, Jordan, is a house, a car, and then a diamond. And uh, do, are you married? I am. And I went through and did a show about the diamond hustle and about how it's just like complete BS. That's why when you go to return a diamond that you just bought yesterday, they're like, all right, I'll give you 30% of the value. And it's like, what are you talking about? The, the policies are bad. But even so, like the whole thing as you know, is set up to be a cartel by De Beers, so the prices are controlled. They're not worth anywhere near what they are, they're sold for, so they're not an investment by any stretch because a wholesaler or somebody who buys them with their actual cost, it's, if you, it's maybe 10, 20, 30% of what, uh, if that, of what you're paying in the store. The margins are, like, enormous. Oh, uh, you know, I, I, you talk about pinning it i know how it works in De beers and how they make a, a jeweler come there and they take three bags and put them in a room and say you each get that bag's two million that bed's two million that bag's two million take which one you want or one million two million you and you have to take the garbage that's in it or not and you know a lot of people don't notice the russians were going to open up mines they had and would have would have tanked the market but the beers went in and bought them out for billions and billions and billions of dollars because otherwise the whole market's done. The whole industry's done. The worth of stuff is just done. What do you feel after a robbery? You know, what do you, what's like going through your head as you're running out the door after you get back to your campsite or your motel room or whatever? Wow. Uh, I always wanted to be that, that uh, fly on the wall. It's such exhilaration. It's like you won. You know, your adrenaline goes for the first hour. And then once you start calming down, it's like, wow, I just did it. And then it's, you know, you're still you're still good until you get rid of it, until you get the cash in your hand. When I had the cash in my hand, then it was a whole different animal. Then it's like, oh, now you're really – then it's party time, number one. I was Atlantic City, and it was cocaine, and it was women, and it was everything you can think. So it was just like off the charts, a party time off the charts. What was your largest personal take from a robbery? Like how much after you fence everything, you split it with the crew? You know, what's like the smallest you ever made and the largest you ever made in one in one uh, gig? One gig, a 400K in my pocket after paying everybody doing everything. And then uh, and that multiple times is up there. I was robbing like the, most of the stores were around a million and maybe a million two, a million three, depending. Uh, smallest was about seventy five thousand in my pocket, and that was I can remember that store that was in Savannah, Georgia. It was I, I think we got two hundred and fifty thousand worth. It was a suck ass store, and after paying everybody and the trip, and I said, "What a fucking waste this was." But it was it was a chain store. It was a Freedman's, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, most of them were pretty good because I cased them very well. I didn't just case them, you know, they had to be right in all aspects. I left cities. I left the areas because they weren't right. And then you go to another area. And I hadn't planned out where to go before I even started the trip. When I knew my safe had under 50000 in it, I would then start thinking about the next robbery. And mm -hmm. uh, How many a year were you running? Like eight, ten? Or, no, or like five? no, no, about three, three to five, depending, okay. you know, depending on... Well, three let uh, three times. We yeah, have three, three or four, five maybe. I'm trying to think of which years, because I robbed about twenty something stores in six years, seven years, something like that. Six years, so eighty nine. So you're doing like a, a million bucks a year, give or take, in like nineteen nineteen eighties money, really. Right. So that's pretty right. In late eighties, early nineties. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Late eighties, early nineties. I was living a couple million bucks tax free in today's money. That's pretty good. Oh, more than that after it was all said and done. I lost three million in casinos, but I also ended up buying stuff with it and then working the money by putting it on the street. They call it and making loan shark money and being a bookmaker and buying nightclubs and buying things that made money too. And then, uh, and then when you're not playing by the rules, you're making money until you fucking burn it. Or oh, I burned a pizzeria. Or I did so many things. 
When you say burn it, do you mean literally like light it on fire because it's not making money anymore? I, I went for the insurance money. Yep. That's uh, it. That, if you read the book, that hole's in there. They, uh, yeah. And, I mean, I just want to make sure we get all the good du- juicy <laughs> details for uh, for everybody. <laughs> yeah, I did the vi- I did a video on that. And it, I actually went back to the pizzeria. And uh, back, it's not a pizzeria; it's a re- it's a Mexican restaurant now. But it, the plaza's there and everything. It was it was real surreal going back there area, to that area. Did you ever think I might get caught doing this? You know, you, you always know you're going to get caught or think you're going to die. There's no question about that. But it wasn't like I uh, I said, "Oh, this is the day I'm getting caught." No, you you know, you if you did, you'd be an idiot because then you wouldn't do it. But you know down, deep down this is the life you live, and, and there's only two ways out, get caught or not. I know your brother got shot during one of the robberies. What happened there? Wow, the last robbery were in Fairless Hills. Uh, oh, it was your last time? That was the last robbery. Oh, of course, right? Was it, was it your last because he got shot, or was it just luck, quote-unquote, that he got shot on the final round? Because of that one, the, the police work was so intense that uh, they ended up getting us. And they I did not know this at the time. The FBI would flood an area. And when they would flood the area, they used to go to every jewelry store in the whole, like, 20-mile radius and ask, do you see these anybody with this ammo? Blah, blah. This one lady said yes. Oh, this nice young man came in here. And I got his license plates. I was going to sell him a ring or something of that nature. And it happened it happened to be a car I rented. But I didn't rent it. A guy who worked for me, Fat Tommy, rented it. And when he rented it, I was a co-driver. And when they looked me up as a co-driver, boy, the alarms went off. Organized crime. I had a couple other convictions for drugs. Not major. Like I was got caught with 35000 cash and five grams of coke back in the day. And that was all from jewelry robberies. You know, they thought they had a drug deal. And I was never into drug dealing. But they thought they had a drug deal because of the money and the stuff. But it was really jewelry money. And I was going to gamble. But anyway, uh, so unbeknownst to us, about three weeks before the robbery, somebody stole an air conditioner on the roof of the building. None of us knew this. It was a plaza. Hmm. And when we went into this store, a neighbor heard commotion, but just thought it was something maybe on the roof or something again. It was coming over, and she looked in the window. And when she looked in the window, it was, go, go, go. And that's when we ran out, and the guy somehow got out of his flex cuffs. And I took six guns with me. Like, he had six guns. He was a gun nut. And all of a sudden, we're running out, and we hear the the glass above us goes, splatters, shot fire. Holy shit. We're bucking out of there. I jump in the car. I duck, like, down in. I see the guy level his gun at my head. Oh, man. Right right, right at the windshield, because the car's pulled in straight. He levels the gun right. He goes, levels it right at, right my head. I duck. The bullet crosses skims the top of my head i mean another inch i'm dead and my brother leaned forward to go low too and it went in his back and in then into his arm and it's still in his arm and uh so he you know he goes i'm hit i'm hit i go i'm hit because there was blood coming down my uh my head you know a little bit but it was a scrape i didn't feel anything the adrenaline was pumping but again having a planned getaway literally where to go what road to hit everything was planned to the nines and we ended up getting back to brooklyn and getting cleaned up and he i was going to drop him off at the hospital he says i'm hit i said i'll drop you out he goes no 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 i'm all right i'll be all right and he was thank god you know, I think about that. If he would have died, that's murder, you know? Yeah. And how do you and live with brother. that? And it's your, I was just going to say, how do you live with that? So anyway, and we ended up uh, getting back to Brooklyn, getting him cleaned up, getting me cleaned up, getting the car fixed, did everything. And because of that FBI work, more intense on that robbery than ever. They got us. Really? So you did did any family members go like oh how did 
I don't know your brother's name, but how did he get shot? Or how did he get his arm hurt? No, no, no. The only one who knew about it was we were going <laughs> to, we a funny story. We were going to take him to a vet. We had a, fr a friend who, who used to go to the track. I said, hey, Uncle Louie, I need a doctor. My brother got shot. Okay, what do you mean? He calls you. Well, I doubt a veterinarian will do it, <laughs> you know, under the table. I said, it can't be a doctor that you know. At the time, my mother worked. She's a, a, a RN, and she worked at a doctor's office. And when we got back to Florida, my mother doesn't know. My mother's the most innocent woman. I'm not kidding in your, in your life. And she... We I we end up telling my mother, hey mom, I was playing with we were playing with guns in the bar and Davy got shot. He's all right, but what do we do now? And we can't go to the hospital because if he does, then I shot him. I'll go in trouble. So my mother took him to the clinic and fixed him up and and didn't take it out. She knew there would be more damage taking the bullet out than trying to leave it in there. And she gave him tetanus shots and she kept the antibiotics and she she fixed them up, so to speak. Oh my God. Your mom must have been freaking out. I don't know. You know, you'd think she would be, but she wasn't, Jordan. She says, my mother's a New York woman, you know. Her dad was a, my dad was a union construction. He was a union delegate. He built the World Trade Center. So they, you know, he was in the fringes of little things. And uh, do, do you think she knew, like, oh, they were playing with guns at the bar and she's just like, I don't want to know. She had to know, right? You know, a part of me thinks that. A part of me does think that. Yes, what you just said. But I don't know. My mother never, this is not, this is a true statement. My mother never in her life used the word fuck. And I, I'm not that I use it every day either, but it's just, you know, it's a word that comes out when you're doing a story or whatever, but she's never even cursed ever in her life. She's 80. My mom, I take care of my mom, Jordan. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, she's still around? You got to ask her if she knew. You know, she's not not great. She's 87. She'll be 88. And uh, she's still with it. And I take care of her. That's what I do now. I, I am home to take care of my mom. I mean, she took care of me those years, so I take care of her. Yeah. She might not remember, and she might not want to revisit that now that I think about uh, it. No, she's all right. Because she'll, she'll, she'll go, oh, be quiet. Who cares about that? I'll say. <laughs> you know, that's how she'll do it. She, she don't care. She sits and plays Sudoku all day and watches Steve <laughs> Harvey and the Game Show Network. I mean, it's just so, I, I you know, Joe, is so funny. My mother's watching Match Game 74. I says, Mom, everybody on this show is dead. She goes, I know, but I didn't see the show. <laughs> I said, you crazy. <laughs> Match game 74. The show's 56 years old. Right? 74, 84, 94, 2004, 2014, 47, almost 50 years old. I said, it's Jeez. crazy. It's crazy. 46 years old, the show. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's like watch, like watching Johnny Carson host something or whatever, or Ed, like Ed McMahon and like, all these old shows. So, all right. So you said you finally got caught by the FBI. How did they piece this together? They didn't catch you in the act, right? They did investigative work and found you. Do you know? Do you have any idea what it was? Oh, yeah. I told you. They got the lady, uh, and then they ended up putting it together. They had a file on me. I didn't notice. They had. They were looking for me for six years, and they had the ones that said I was the biggest that ever did it. And uh, so they, they were looking for me for a long time, and they put all these cases together, and it took took them a while, took them over a month and a half just to figure that out. And then uh, they they got they ended up having four eyewitnesses after the fact of knowing me that would pick me out at a, but they ended up closing the case on over twenty stores. Oh wow. Yeah. So they got they, they got their man, so to speak. And then what would the what we did was we did we called it Rule Twenty. A uh, rule twenty is when you in court Jordan and you and you get all your cases brought to one district so it gets handled in one spot and that's it. How many stores did you total in total did you rob or or should I say how many stores did you get caught for? <laughs> well, total? yeah, good point. Uh I was convicted for four stores and closed I think 21, 22. I don't even know if there, there might be a few more out there. The, might uh, be. yeah, might be. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, so ended up going to do four, and I ended up getting four 12 year sentences to run, con uh, simultaneously, right? Concurrent, 
Not consecutive. Concurrently. Concurrent. It's right. called running wild or running consecutive. Consecutive is you run together. Concurrent runs together. If it's consecutive, it's one after the other. Right. So you mm -hmm. do 12, do 12. No, I had them concurrent. And I did that. I ended up not having – if they wanted to do that, I would have went to trial in every single federal district. I would have made them take all the people. It cost them millions and millions of dollars. It would have took them. But they ended up agreeing to run it concurrent, and then uh, nobody was killed. It wasn't like a murder yeah. or anything like that. So, And they decided to agree to it after I beat the gun charge. I had to beat a gun charge. They charged me with a gun. I didn't use a gun. So I beat the gun charge, and when I beat the gun charge – that's when it got uh, 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 the twelve years. Did you did you stash any money? I mean, I know everyone probably asks you that, and the answer is always no, right? Like every time I talk to somebody who's in the mob, they're always like, "I wish I did, but I didn't." What can I say? Every single one. Exact answer. Nobody ever stashes any money, eh? No. Well, well you know, let me tell you something. That's a funny story because John Gotti once said. Any man who has a 401k or has got a retirement fund, I'm going to kill him because you didn't retire in this life. Mm -hmm. You 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 live to the hustle. You'll, you'll see them up until uh, Sonny Francis, which is Michael Francis's father, just died. I think it was near 100. And he was hustling right up to the day he died. Literally, that age, you think, I'm retiring. Fuck No. You'll see them 75. They slow down, but they're always scheming, always conniving, always bookmaking, always doing something. It's in their blood. It's in your blood. I don't know how it got out of my blood. I think seeing the destruction I've seen in my own life and not wanting to lose my grandkids. You know, I lost my kids. My son was uh, six years old when I went to prison. I got out and he was 18. My daughter- oh, wow was 15 months old i got out and she was 13 years old so if that don't hurt you nothing's gonna hurt you you know because i lost their lives now i have two grandkids and he's four and the other's two you think i'm gonna do anything to go lose their lives not a chance so i always say if i go to back prison now i'm gonna kill you because i'm going forever and i'm not mm -hmm. gonna you know i'm not gonna go half ask on the deal so <laughs> and and i look at that like uh I was I was a lucky one, Jordan, to be able to get out in my life because of uh, going to do time and not ratting. I wouldn't rat. I don't believe in ratting to this day. To this day, I, I believe a person's word should mean something. I've heard you say that the most important skills in a heist are organization and planning, staying calm under pressure, Knowing that you've built all of those skill sets in spades and you were successful at what you did, do you wish you'd chosen a different profession? And if so, what do you think you would have done if you did choose a different path? Great question. Great question. Uh, you know, I'm a believer in fate. I think things happen for a reason. Uh, why am I alive? Literally, people say I'm like nine lives. I got about three left. Uh, so. I don't know. I think it's fate. I, I did what I did. I got. I think I would have been good at anything, to be honest with you. I think I'd have been a great lawyer. I did the law work in prison, won cases in the law, and I was very good at the law. Still am. Uh, I think I, I like to help people, so I think that's what – I know it's a weird say, well, look at a profession you went. You went to rob people. But I was also like a Robin Hood. I threw parties, did crazy things with people. But as far as I think I would have been a lawyer, I don't, you know, there's a great people always say, do you regret? I don't regret a thing, Jordan. What I do doing is different? Absolutely. Bill Gates said that. The guy's the richest man in the world, and he says I'd do different. He's, you know, doesn't mean he's not going to be rich. It means he's going to do things different, take away the bad. I mean, I wish I could and go back and do it, but you can't, so you have to live with it. And when you live with it, you have to, accept it and forgive yourself and then hope people forgive you and make amends, which I've tried many, many times to do, but you can only do so much. And now it's about helping people more to not make the choices I made. Listen, I'm not the only guy like me who thinks like me 
who might go down that drug path, you know, like you said earlier, how about the kid who doesn't know his dad was drunk on drugs? And you, you named the great scenario. That was a great, mm-hmm. great scenario you did. And and I look at that and, and I'm hoping, and I get, you know, one of the blessings I do have, Jordan, is I get many, many, many emails of people saying to me, Larry, you saved my life. Uh, Larry, you, this meant more to me. I'm not doing drugs anymore. I was in a bad place. I had depression and you helped me out of it or a lot of things. And those things that are what you I get the idiots too. Fuck you. And you know, you'll always be a criminal. Yeah, you get some of those, but not, I got such weighted to the good. And that makes you keep going and makes you say, you know, you're doing the right thing. Larry, thank you so much. Super interesting story. Really appreciate the candor and your mission now to keep people away from what you were doing back then is admirable. I mean, a lot of guys could have just got out of prison and said, screw it. I'm just going to write a bunch of, you know, glorify this and make some money. Dig up yeah. some money and leave. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the uh, Thanks, Jordan. Hey, listen, what you need to let me know or what we need, we can help you guys. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you once again very much. Jordan. All right. Have a great one, man. For a lot more on the Jordan Harbinger Show podcast that you will not find on YouTube, go ahead and check out the feed at jordanharbinger.com. Check out the Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Now click here for an interview with Billy McFarlane, the creator of Firefest, serving his time in federal prison. We did the interview from prison. Also, you can click here for an interview with the enforcer, Anthony Salvatore Luciano Raimondi, former enforcer for the Italian mob. Of course, click right here to subscribe to the channel.